some games are special to us for all kinds of reasons. But then you have that special special one that defines what video games mean to you. For me, it's Pokemon Gold, Silver and Crystal versions. Which is technically three games, but for simplicity's sake let's just say that Crystal is the best. Of course, favorite doesn't necessarily mean the best, that's Heart, Gold and Soul Silver. But today marks their 20th anniversary. 20 entire years have passed since Gold and Silver were first released in Japan. Though I only got to play them in 2001 because Europe can and did in fact get screwed. Gold and Silver's development was a troubled one. Originally titled Pocket Monsters 2 Gold and Silver, Game Freak planned the commercial release in 1997. Improvements and additions to the Generation 1 games were announced, with a handful of screenshots showing the Super Game Boy enhanced world. Alas, despite having a playable demo in the 1997 edition of Nintendo Space World, the year ended with the game still unreleased. It wasn't until March of 1998 that Game Freak spoke once more, removing the number from the title and announcing that the games had been delayed, obviously. Presumably, it was around this time that the original plans were scrapped and Game Freak started working on what we ended up getting. This wouldn't be the last delay, however. Gold and Silver later got a provisional release date of June of 1999, and Game Freak showed new artwork for some Pokémon, along with some screenshots featuring the new battle screen. Ultimately though, the games were only released on the 21st of November. The final product was still compatible with the Game Boy, but it's clear that Game Freak wanted to take advantage of the Game Boy Color's enhanced hardware. Somewhat famously, Satoru Iwata also helped compress the game's assets so that it would be possible to include two whole regions. God bless him. Since then, there has been new information about the old concept, and last year we finally got a chance to explore the mysterious 1997 Space World demo, about which much has been speculated. Hell, I rambled about it for 30 minutes. But like I said in that video, I am happy with the final result. Very happy. Generation 1 had that distinct first game weirdness to it, and it wasn't exactly polished. I don't think its problems ruined the experience in any significant way, but it's true. Generation 2 establishes itself as the Pokémon we know today. Dialogue, mechanics, world, everything would feel right at home in later titles, while Generation 1 would probably get a few awkward stares. The passage of time might have left them somewhat outdated, but they remain excellent games in their own right. Not perfect, but Gold, Silver and Crystal are extremely well-polished games that have resonated in the hearts of many. I am one of those, and I am here to tell you why. Before that, let me just say that I will be spoiling quite a few things about Generation 2. Something tells me that practically all of the people watching this video won't mind that, but you have been warned. Start a new game and meet the new day and night system, which I'll get to later. This is followed by the usual introduction where Professor Oak tells you of the creatures you will domesticate in your travels. After becoming a manwood, you find yourself in your room. Downstairs, Mummy tells you that your Pokegear is back from repairs and to go see Professor Elm. He has a mission for you. A friend of his claims to have discovered something incredible, but unironically this time. To get there, however, you have to cross the grass from which wild Pokémon will jump out and attack you. Because this cute little thing will kill you to death and eat your corpse, I guess? I don't know, man, seems pretty harmless to me. He lets you choose between Cyndaquil, Totodile and Chikorita, the game's fire, water and grass type starters. He then sends you off to go see the walking quickbait, passing through Cherry Grove City. After arriving at his house, Mr. Pokémon gives you a mysterious egg. Coincidentally, Professor Oak also stopped by for a visit and he gives you a Pokédex. What luck! Outside, Professor Elm calls, urging you to hurry back because something terrible has happened. On the way back, you're stopped by this clown who insults you and challenges you to a Pokémon battle because that's what criminals do in this world. He sends out one of the starters you didn't pick, so you can guess what happened. 
After humiliating him, the tryhard whines for a bit, says his name is and runs away. Back at Elm's laboratory, a policeman asks you for the perpetrator's name. Make it count. So yeah, Elm's Pokemon got stolen and he stops caring 5 seconds later. But you have made an incredible discovery, because Pokemon eggs were unheard of until now. He's also amazed that you got a Pokedex, because Professor Oak knows potential when he sees it. Professor Elm suggests that you take the gym challenge. And now, the Johto journey truly begins. And man, these pixels feel like home sweet home. I swear I know them better than my own family. The game begins in this comfy little place called New Bark Town. You will then cross Cherry Grove, a lakeside town where your fate intertwines with that of a red-haired clown desperate to become the world's greatest edge lord. In Violet City, you get your first taste of the gym challenge and of Choto's culture, inspired by Japanese religion and architecture. The Sprout Tower tests your resolve to become the very best. Once you cross the Union Cave's rocky halls, you arrive in Asalia Town, home to a certain legend and many slowpokes. But also where Team Rocket begins to stir up trouble after three years of silence. Beyond the Ilex Forest is the modern metropolis of Goldenrod City, whose existence contrasts against the more traditional parts of Chioto. The radio tower stands tall as the biggest point of interest, but you also find a few other facilities and even someone that you might recognize. Ecrutic City is the birthplace of one of Chioto's greatest legends, and the finest example of the region's traditions. At the same time, it's a solemn place with a tragedy still in the minds of its people. Olofine City is the region's port town, where you might eventually find transportation to somewhere else. A giant lighthouse, with a really weird layout, shines the nearby seas. In the crystal version, you'll also find the battle tower just outside its vicinity. After acquiring a method for crossing the sea, you pass by the mysterious Whirl Islands, their entrances blocked by whirlpools. Further along lies Cyanwood, at the western ends of Choto's ocean routes. On the other side of Acrutique, you can explore Mount Mortar or calmly surf towards Mahogany Town, which hides a few secrets. Choto's final city is Blackthorn, where many dragon trainers live. In the back is the Dragon's Den, a sacred place for those who follow the path of the Dragon type. Once you acquire Choto's last badge, you go all the way back to New Bark Town. As it turns out, the starting point of your adventure also leads to the Indigo Plateau, where the Elite Four and the Champion await you. And that's not even getting into how much more flavor all the other locations in Chioto have, like the mysterious ruins of Alf, or the Slowpoke Well, or the Wake of Rage. They illustrate how much impact the Pokémon have on the world. It's the Pokémon world, not just a world with electric rats sprinkled on top. By comparison, Kanto is pretty friggin' dull. Most locations don't have any lore or deeper meaning to them other than existing because the developers needed another town or another route or another dungeon. There were exceptions like the Pokémon Tower and Pokémon Mansion, but those were, well, exceptions. But speaking of Kanto, once you finally defeat the champion, your journey isn't over. After the credits roll, Professor Elm will call you, saying that he has something for you. You know, visiting the previous game's locations is one of the most powerful things you can do in a sequel. The story might be over, all the plot threads might have been solved, and the characters might have gotten their happy ending. But nothing shows what the result of the game's events were, quite like going back to that world after a time skip. And that is what these games did. You have conquered Chioto, and now it's time to conquer Kanto. You have the same gyms, the same routes, the same locations, mostly. And oh boy, you're in for a real goddamn surprise at the end. It's these kinds of moments that made Generation 2 so memorable, and it gives the two regions a connection that just isn't present in the following games, aside from Gen 5. 
so it's a shame that Game Freak hasn't done this more often. The only other mainline title that does this is Black 2 and White 2, which is probably one of the reasons why I appreciate them more and more with every playthrough. Let's go supposedly does kinda sort of take place after the original events, but the rest is just the same, so really, what the hell are these games? And besides, with Game Freak releasing one Pokemon game every year now, maybe it's the perfect time to do this. Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon are pretty cool by themselves, but I doubt that they require as much budget and effort as creating a whole new region and designing new Pokemon. Doing something like Black 2 and White 2 again would be way more feasible, since a good portion of the assets are already there. And hey, maybe then you wouldn't piss off the fans and usher in a new age of internet slap fights over everyone's favorite picks for the roster. In terms of gameplay, Generation 2 builds upon the foundations of Generation 1 with several new features, a whole bunch of tweaks, a lot of rebalancing and a hundred new Pokémon. You have turn-based one-on-one battles where Pokémon attempt to murderize each other by breathing fire and shooting laser beams. By defeating opponents, Pokémon gain experience points, racing in level, increasing their stats and potentially evolving. Every Pokémon also has its own type combination. Pokémon can learn up to four moves at once, each with their own power, accuracy and a type that determines how effective they are against the opponent. Moves can be learned in a variety of ways, mainly by leveling up or by using TMs and HMs. Each type is also categorized as either physical or special, being affected by either attack and defense or special attack and special defense. Yeah, that's one of the major differences from Chen 1. Special no longer covers both offense and defense, buffing certain Pokémon that had low special or nerfing Pokémon that had high special. Just because you're good at using special attacks doesn't mean you're good at getting schwacked by them anymore. Two new types have been added into the mix. Dark is a special type effective against and immune to Psychic, which bullied the hell out of everything in Chen 1. Steel is a physical type focused on defense, being resistant to a whole bunch of other types. Chen 2 also implements held items, providing various effects. The best example of this is related to the time mechanics. You can grab berries from trees every day, and unlike man-made items such as potions, Pokémon use these berries automatically, restoring a bit of HP or healing a status condition. At the very start of the game, you have to set the time, day of the week and weather to enable daylight saving time. In case your country is intelligent enough to not use it, DST is a stupid practice where clocks advance one hour during summer, sort of resulting in people having more daylight in their free time so that they can spend more time and money shopping. Certain wild Pokémon and events only show up at certain times. An example is the Bug Catching Contest, available every Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. You have 20 balls to find the strongest Pokémon you can inside the National Park, earning you goodies depending on the result. The gameplay additions are interesting, but the main reason I like it is due to how nice the world looks at night. The contrast between the yellow lights and the blue tinted environments is like sex in your eyes. You can check the time in your Poké Gear, along with a couple of other gadgets. You have a map, a radio player with a handful of programs, and a contact list. You can talk to Professor Elm and your mother at any time, but you can also find other trainers who will call you to be annoying. A new series staple is breeding, which works like this. Every Pokémon is part of certain egg groups, and the Pokémon within these groups can do the thing with each other. The offspring will inherit the species of the female, while the male can pass down any egg moves it knows. Yeah, genders are a thing now. After leaving two compatible Pokémon in the daycare and letting them do the thing, you will get an egg. Keep it in your party for a while and it will eventually hatch into a level 5 baby. These mechanics won't let you crossbreed species in the vein of Dragon Quest monsters, and it's very much aimed at competitive players, but I appreciate the inclusion anyway, even if I practically never do it. Some other lesser additions have also become staples, such as TMs that have a secondary use. 
Headbutt is an example, allowing you to find wild Pokémon by shaking a certain type of tree. A ton of new balls have also been added, including a few that are made from the apricorns found in buried trees. You can also find shiny Pokémon, which have different colors but are otherwise the same. Happiness is now a thing too. Yellow version had a simple system in place for Pikachu, but Generation 2 expands this also hidden value to all Pokémon. It doesn't matter for most things, but a select few Pokémon evolve by being happy enough, while two new moves have their power depend on the user's happiness. The games as a whole are also just plain nicer in general, with quality of life improvements such as the inventory being divided into four sections, the move screen, the updated battle screen, etc. Everything just feels smoother and more polished compared to Generation 1's Bethesda moments. And while it's not perfect, Generation 2 is significantly more well-balanced than its predecessors, much thanks to the special split, the competent AI and the increased move variety. There are less cases of Pokémon only warning garbage moves by leveling up, and the TMs you can buy are actually pretty decent. This is all part of why I think that Generation 2 stood the test of time way better than Generation 1. So now that the jerking off has reached its climax, we come to everyone's favorite part, the one where I talk crap about the games I like. The obvious wank stains are the holdovers from Generation 1. Again, I'm not going too deep into these, since this video is a follow-up to the previous one and I've talked plenty of crap about them already. Stat experience and individual values are fully intact. Long story short, stat experience is earned from defeating Pokémon, slowly building up a bonus for each stat. And the higher they are, the higher the Pokémon's stats will be. And once again, we get a middle finger. The variables remain hidden, so you never know exactly what values you have without calculating it manually, which nobody wants to do because that's annoying and stupid. Good news though, just like Generation 1, you can safely pretend that they don't exist. And yeah, the badge bonuses are here too, in all their misleading glory. Because who the hell wants accurate numbers in a game whose mechanics are almost entirely driven by numbers, am I right? HMs are back with a vengeance. There are now seven of them, with Waterfall as a way to climb... waterfalls? And Whirlpool as cut, but in the water this time. In combat, Whirlpool is garbalicious, dealing a paltry amount of damage for a handful of turns, while Waterfall was born two generations too early. But at least you can delete them this time. You're still forced to use them, but your Pokémon won't be cripples for life. TMs are in a similar situation of one step forward and one step nowhere, because while the move selection is better, you are still limited to a single one for most of them. The big elephant in the room also remains to this day. Once again, you have two versions with minimal differences, and you need to trade Pokémon between each version in order to complete the Pokédex, which is a real quillfish in the ass for people who don't have easy access to the friend resource. To be fair, held items do make a pretty compelling argument for finding people to trade with, allowing you to potentially acquire multiple copies of unique items, at least without Blessed Pokémon Stadium. Now let's talk about problems that come from Gold and Silver themselves. One of the biggest points of contention is the level curve, potentially resulting in the player's party being underleveled for the Elite Four. Once you reach Ecrutic, you can either head left towards Olivine or head right towards Mahogany. To let players go wherever they want, the levels of wild Pokémon and trainers had to be kept low. However, Gold and Silver don't have any scaling, so after wrecking one side, you'll be overleveled for the other, but don't get enough experience to match the levels of the Elite Four, which range between 40 and 50. Personally, I don't think this is that big of a problem since the player has some advantages, such as stat experience and batch boosts, a decent move selection, and the ability to spam recovery items. The champion's Pokémon are a threat, but they also have a major weakness to ice. The real problem comes after the Elite Four. Levels in Kanto are much lower, and sometimes the wild Pokémon are even in the single digits. 
I understand this from a world building perspective, but in terms of gameplay, this is friggin' stupid. Especially since the game's hardest battle has Pokemon in the 70s. Some people also dislike how some new Pokemon can only be found in Kanto. I agree that it shouldn't take so long to see the new Pokemon, but at the same time, these games feature two regions instead of one, so they should be seen as a single package, and both Gen 1 and Gen 2 Pokemon complement each region. Having said that, Kanto is pretty undercooked. There is very little story content and some of its locations have either been squished down or removed completely. As a result, Kanto can be finished in a couple of hours. And speaking of undercooked, the cool legendaries on the box are pretty much irrelevant. At one point you get an item that lets you face them, but it's optional and never mentioned ever again. But try as they might, these problems are incapable of settling down the figurative boner I have for Generation 2. And in December of 2000, it only got harder, with the release of the obligatory third version. As is the norm, Crystal Version is a revision rather than a whole new game. It includes new story elements focused on the three legendary... gerbils? A mysterious man named Yusin has spent years chasing after Suicune, and the two of you will cross paths during the journey. The mystery of the Unknown and the Ruins of Health has also been slightly expanded. Small but appreciated quality of life improvements have been added. Elemental stones were stupidly limited before, but now a few specific contacts can randomly gift you them. Vocations now display their name when you reach them, and some map adjustments make the world just that little bit better. Major points for the animated front sprites, which are all excellent and add some personality to your ones and zeros. Crystal marks the introduction of a female player character, this blue-haired cutie who got erased by her. Crystal is the first to introduce a battle tower too. This is basically a competitive battling simulator, with the battle style locked to set and no regular items allowed. The player and the AI fight on the level playing field, and you strive to beat as many in a row as you can. The Japanese version also had some neat extras. Goldenrod had a big fat Pokémon Center that could use the short-lived mobile system Chibi surface. Before shutting down in 2002, players could trade and battle each other through the internet by connecting to a mobile phone. One event gave players the infamous GS Ball, which would let players fight and catch Celebi in Ewex Forest. The entire thing is translated and fully playable in international releases, but there is no way to acquire the GS Ball without hacks or cheat codes. I guess the problem with Crystal is that it's a hard sell if you own gold or silver. Pretty much every flaw they had is still present in Crystal, and a portion of the stuff it adds is pretty insignificant on the whole, or kind of superficial. And don't forget that Crystal is no longer compatible with the original Game Boy. Don't get me wrong, I love the animated sprites, and the extra story elements are nice, but Crystal barely touches the gameplay. The level curve is still friggin' stupid, HMs are still annoying, and Kanto is still bare bones. Unlike, say, Yellow or Platinum, there isn't much else to say about it without repeating myself. But on its own, Crystal Version is the definitive Generation 2 game, and holds a special place in my heart. Gold and Silver were already amazing as far as my biased view is concerned, and Crystal is Gold and Silver 1.5. Like Generation 1, the trio was also eventually released on the 3DS Virtual Console, with the cool wireless functionality and connectivity to Pokémon Bank, so you can bring your team of pixels into the 3D age. After the Hoenn games, Kanto came back from the dead, and the gates were open. Maybe one day I would also see a reborn Johto. I don't remember exactly what day it was, but I do remember the day itself like it was yesterday. Rumors pointed to an announcement in one of those TV shows. The Sino games have a bit of a mixed reception nowadays, but I love the hell out of them, and Choto being brought to life in that engine was the perfect mix. 
I awaited the announcement while talking to a friend of mine who also loved the Pokemon games. At the same time, I desperately tried to contain the hype. The announcement came and holy crap. The games I wanted were revealed. They even showed a small preview, which was just the player running around New Bark Town for 15 seconds. In retrospective, that was pretty lame, but who the hell cared? The remakes were official, it was happening, everyone rejoice! Oh, and it also showed the part where Pokemon followed the player around. Seems like a lot of people really want that feature to come back. Heart Gold and Soul Silver were released in September of 2009, and boy oh boy, Game Freak went above and beyond with these remakes. Fire Red and Leaf Green were cool, but they were just Kanto in Chen 3. But these remakes give the experience a different flavor, free from the Game Boy's limitations or development setbacks. The cultural aspect, for example, is a lot clearer and more present in the world. Ecrutic gets its own remix of the original music, while Cyan Woods is closer to the original. And unlike the Savvy Islands, the additions in Heart Gold and Soul Silver don't feel disjointed from the rest of the game world. In fact, I really like some of them, but especially Route 47. I don't know what it is, but the music makes me feel nostalgic as balls, even though it's completely new. New story elements have been added. The egg subplot has a totally new significance, Team Rocket's faceless executives now have actual names and personalities, and the cool legendaries are actually relevant now. The protagonist you didn't choose shows up as a support character, and even part of Crystal's plot and characters are included. Many existing locations have had changes to their layouts, sometimes even being completely redesigned. Gyms are a good example, with most of them giving you a new challenge. It's the Johto we all know and love, but expanded and more beautiful than ever. Kanto still isn't as complete as the main Kanto games, of course, but these remakes help it feel much less crippled. Some areas, like the Viridian Forest, have been restored, and the existing ones have been enhanced with new visuals and locations, such as a gathering place for uh, Gym Leader rematches. This is in contrast to Fire Red and Leaf Green, which did piss all with the source material. Remember when they told you to go screw yourself if you wanted more berries? Well, now you can grow them anywhere. But aside from the superficial, what do these remakes bring to the table? Well, the battle mechanics have been upgraded to blessed Gen 4 standards. You have abilities, natures and all that fancy stuff, but the highlight is the physical and special split. Moves are now either physical or special regardless of their type, really helping Pokémon that had high stats on one side and a type in the other. Waterfall finally has a reason to exist outside of being Surf's bottom bitch. Generation 4 also really opened up movesets. Generation 2 was a step forward, but still had plenty of room for improvement. Generation 3 added more moves, but didn't really change the learn sets much from Generation 2. Generation 4, however, combines the physical special split with tons of new moves and a tendency to learn those of a wider selection of types. There are so many more options now. To incorporate everything into each Pokémon's moveset, they now learn moves earlier and at shorter intervals. This generally makes them more reliable from an early level, and the player feels a constant sense of pride and achievement as the dopamine kicks in every few levels. And I think people underestimate how much of a difference this makes to the game's challenge. The player isn't the only one to benefit, and important trainers use more powerful moves and strategies. The cherry on top is all of the extra stuff packed into the games. The extra routes and locations, the extra story elements, the little touches like the chibi sounds. Yeah, that's a thing. It's not a perfect emulation, but I appreciate being able to listen to the original soundtrack. Hell, even some of the new music has 8-bit renditions. Given that the 3DS games just recycled certain tracks from the DS games, I can appreciate the effort. Heart Gold and Soul Silver are the games I know and love, but now fully realized. A dream come true. Nintendo knew they were awesome, because even the packaging goes all the way. These bastards came in some big goddamn boxes and included a little dinkly-doo called Pokewalker. 
It's a fancy pedometer into which you can send one of your Pokémon and walk around with it. The more steps you take, the more watts you acquire. These watts can be used in the Pokéwalker to search for Pokémon, or to search for items. These can then be sent back to your game, along with the watts you didn't use. You unlock more courses through various methods, each one with different Pokémon and items. While it's certainly not essential, this is a fun little gimmick that expands the available Pokémon. The convenience of online trading made it a bit redundant, but playing on an emulator, I do miss finagling around with it. Reminds me of the times I spent waggling it around at school with a friend of mine. With the Nintendo DS also came Nintendo Wi-Fi, letting players from all over the world battle, trade and generally piss each other off. No longer did you have to rely on physically connecting with another system through a dinky little cable. Unfortunately, the surface shut down years ago. But the good news is that there are alternatives maintained by fans. Of course, they only have a fraction of the population, but it's good to have the option. So, wow, these remakes seem like the best thing since sliced bread. But surely there must be something to talk crap about. Well, the chibi sounds can only be acquired at the end game. And it's a Pokémon game, meaning that you have two nearly identical games that could very well just be one. And to avoid sounding like a broken record, let's just say that effort values can go suck a dick, HMs can fall down a cliff, and single-use TMs can go repatriate themselves into Gen 5. Showing what stats are affected by the Pokémon's nature is a move in the right direction, at least. Even though I spent several minutes saying that Game Freak went the extra mile, one of the problems with the remakes is that they also went the extra mile to the side. Choto had some minor adjustments and new sources of XP, but you could argue that the level curve is actually worse, since movesets are way better and you don't have batch boosts and stat experience to serve as a cushion anymore. Unlike the Kanto remakes and the Sinnoh games, you also don't get a VS Seeker. Thankfully, despite wild Pokémon still being low, Kanto's trainers have way more appropriate levels, Cinnabar and Feridian actually have a proper gym, and you have the Elite Four rematches to fight. Back then, there was also a controversy involving age ratings and the game corners, so all the games were replaced with Voltorb Flip. This has been described as a mix between Picross and Minesweeper, which is fairly accurate. You have to guess in which squares the coins are by paying attention to the numbers around the field, telling you how many coins and vault orbs are in each row and column. The games were removed in Platinum 2, but while we could still buy coins with money there, in Heart Gold and Soul Silver you can only get them very slowly by playing Vault Orb Flip, which is a chore to say the least. Some of the best TMs in the game are locked behind this, but at least you can get as many as you want. For nitpicks, we have the remixed music that feels a bit tryhard sometimes, if that makes any sense. It's pretty good overall, but maybe they tried to embellish some tracks more than was necessary. There's also no separate music tracks for day and night like the Sinnoh games, which is a shame. The female protagonist also got replaced by this... undesirable. Jokes aside, I don't mind her, but I'm not fond of how they replaced Chris with a completely new design instead of just updating the old one. But despite all this, I have no hesitation saying that Heart Gold and Soul Silver are candidates for best overall games in the entire franchise. They do exactly what they set out to do, to remake Generation 2 and make it an absolute treat for the fans. And as an artist who loves the games to a frankly disgusting degree, Heart Gold and Soul Silver are mostly everything I wanted and everything I didn't know I wanted. So you'd think that I would consider the remakes to be both the favorites and the best, right? I said that I would tell you why I like them so much, and now I can safely say that I still am not quite sure why. I'm struggling to explain exactly why Generation 2 is so special to me without just waving it away with It's nostalgia, bro. Maybe it's the feeling of discovery, just like how Satoshi Tachiri wished it to be. But then again, the feeling of discovery isn't exclusive to Generation 2, is it? 
Hell, you can jump into something else like Final Fantasy or Legend of Zelda and get a feeling of discovery too, right? Maybe it's because things have changed. Late last year, I had the chance to play through Ultra Moon. Understandably, it's a rather divisive game, taking a different approach without the traditional gyms and a big focus on the story and characters. But for the first two or so hours, I found myself giggling like a little girl for some reason. Of course, that didn't last forever. I am an adult now. I have responsibilities and all sorts of things to worry about. Unlike my younger self, my brain is incapable of focusing 100% on a single thing now. And of course, society has changed. Tons of social networks, messaging programs and the internet in general has made it very easy to get distracted, and it's not uncommon for a good portion of a game to get shown in trailers or to get leaked by some sneaky anonymous person before it's even released. And if there's something you don't know about a game you're playing, you can just look it up online, right? Why bother experimenting yourself when the answer is a Google search away? And naturally, being remakes, I already had an idea of what I was getting with Heart Gold and Soul Silver. And I guess that a part of me is still always trying to reconnect with the good old times. I've played these games a billion times, I don't know literally everything, but I do know quite a lot, and I want to know more even if there's nothing much left to know. I want to experience more of it. That's probably why I regret never being able to find a copy of Pokemon Stadium 2, or why I patiently awaited the release of Pokemon Prism for over a decade. Remember when it was still Pokemon Bronze? And that's probably why I'm kind of frustrated that the ruins of Alf didn't really amount to anything besides magic letter animals. Yes, I know that there are details in the anime and manga, but those aren't canon. Yeah, there are some interesting theories, like the one where the ruins of Alf are actually ground zero for the Hiroshima bombings of World War II, the Yunon are actually the people who died there and got revived by ho and the weird radio transmission is their screams of agony or just radiation. Oh, the edge. But whatever, this is getting too gloomy. Maybe not knowing the solution is for the best. Some people would argue that a mystery you can theorize about is better than a mystery with a boring solution. And just like the ruins of Alf, maybe the reason these games mean so much to me doesn't need to be explained. Or maybe it's not worth explaining since nobody else will completely understand it. The specific nostalgia I have is mine and mine alone. Many people have played these games, but only I have the memories that unlock the door to the exact experience I had, even if I don't really get it either. Regardless, here we are celebrating it 20 years later. Who knows what the anniversary will bring? Maybe something cool that will render this video outdated right away? Generation 2 is a wonderful, polished and entertaining pile of mysteries. And I will love these mysteries forevermore.